Kevin Tucker. I'm the Churchill Club CEO. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you. This morning we present Hartmut Esslinger, legendary designer, co-founder of Frog Design, and author of a new book called A Fine Line, How Design Strategies Are Shaping the Future of Business. And Guy Kawasaki, of course, is here to lead the discussion. Hartmut and Guy, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. I would also... And I would also like to thank Fenwick and West for their generous sponsorship and co-hosting of this event. Fenwick and West is one of the club's strongest partners. And let me also recognize Alltop, alltop.com, as a sponsor of this event. The purpose of Alltop is to help you answer the question, what's happening in the topics, all the topics that interest you. Our next program will be held on Wednesday, September 16, right here at Fenwick, as we offer Randy Komisar of Kleiner Perkins uh, with Getting to Plan B about breaking through to a uh, better business model in conversation with well-known New York Times correspondent John Markoff. And next, it's one of the biggest events of the year with Larry Ellison on September 21st. That's a Monday in conversation with Ed Zander, former CEO of Motorola and former president of Sun Microsystems. This is a members only and only at the Churchill Club event. Uh, and um, I hope a rare chance to see Larry Ellison unplugged. And finally, on Wednesday, September 30, longtime tech journalist and author Kevin Maney will lead a discussion with NetSuite CEO Zach Nelson and EA Electronic Arts founder Trip Hawkins about business decisions around high fidelity and convenience. It's called Trade Off, a new way to see your business plan without the use of psychedelic drugs. We aim to help you get ahead. Visit churchillclub.org for details on these programs. For those of you less familiar with the club, it is the premier business and technology forum in the Bay Area with 6,300 members and 24 years of dynamic in the news programs. We are a member supported nonprofit organization and I would like to thank our members present this morning for your support. And I would like to invite those of you who are not members to consider joining us. Uh, Amanda Graves is our personal membership manager. Amanda, please raise your hand. And Marcia Nguyen is our Director of Corporate Relations, Marcia. Uh, Amanda and Marcia would be pleased to help you non-members get connected with us. Now it's my honor to introduce our moderator, Guy Kawasaki, who will then introduce our guest of honor. Uh, the thing is, I am pretty sure that no one in business in Silicon Valley um, doesn't already know Guy. Uh, that he <laughs> <laughs> famously is, uh, what, is an Apple Fellow, helped launch the Macintosh uh, that he wrote nine books um, on the Macintosh way, Art of the Start, and on, um, that he co-founded it and is a managing director of Garage Technology Ventures, and that his um, great blog is called How to Change the World, a Practical Blog for Impractical People. Uh, Guy is a prolific writer and communicator. He really likes to tweet. And in fact, over a year ago, he launched Alltop, uh, which is an innovative and valuable resource for quickly assessing the best material available on topics of interest to you. You can quickly get addicted to it. Let's now welcome Guy Kawasaki. Working? Yeah. Yeah, they're always working for me. Well, they need to hear you talk about it. So <laughs> this is good. Well, the question's number one for me, though, isn't it? I must say my name is Hartmut Esslinger. When I immigrated, uh, the immigration officer who also was not speaking clean English, by the way, proposed that I change my name to something easier like Tim Smith or John Miller. But uh, I was used to my name, so I kept it and still fight it. 
So with PubMed, with public health domains, anyway, uh, born in Germany uh, long ago, 65 years ago. And uh, at age five, I decided to design cars, whatever. There were not many cars yet in Germany, but at that time, yes, there were. And uh, through some obstacles, going through music, going through engineering, going through the army, finally, I became a designer. However, uh, the, the teaching of personal design through a couple of obstacles was that design doesn't stand alone, but it's a coordinated profession. It has, uh, has a lot to do with business, with culture, with people, especially. And uh, so I started my own company during uh, studies, which is kind of a Silicon Valley spirit. But the main reason was uh, there was no job available for somebody like me. And um, so I started my company. Did you get a green card yet? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, I'm a citizen, so. <laughs> okay. Um, well, the point was, uh, I had to work myself. I realized I had to build a company. And uh, the big mission, maybe, that's not so much in the book, was uh, design itself is a pretty uh, difficult uh, topic, which means uh, people think it's aesthetic only, it's about statue, it's about beauty. But in reality, it's about connecting technology and uh, science and business with people. And so a lot of stuff, you know, doesn't sell, doesn't sell because it's not made for people. It's made for engineers, it's made for business, it's mm -hmm. made for marketing. And this integrative aspect of design was what it's, I thought, uh, I can say I discovered it somehow. Is well, that what's the origin of naming your company Frog Design? Because clearly yeah. you're not French. No. So. No, but the, <laughs> <laughs> the passport said. <laughs> I went to school actually for a while. Uh, yeah, in America, the fr French are the frogs, but it's better than the public of Germany. Oh. Yeah. And uh, also, I grew up in an area where there were thousands of frogs. So actually, when we started the company in a little village in Black Forest, we had to drive, and some people then called from a payphone, are you still there? Is it the end of the world? Or <laughs> are we falling into the Rhine River now? Or what happened? <laughs> There's no civilization anywhere. And so we had a frog science, which means at night we have to be careful when the frogs migrate to have sex. And <laughs> <laughs> well that's what they do. And um, so uh, it was kind of logical to call it frog. All right. Um, can you tell us about your early interactions with Apple, what you did for Apple? Uh, I, mean, I bet many people are Apple users in this room, so we'd love to hear those stories. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I think, I think before Apple, you have to understand that uh, I would never, I would never have, would never have worked if I wouldn't have had some experience before mm -hmm. in terms of working directly with CEOs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wrote letters to Sony as a student to Morita himself and said you have to change your design. Finally, they hired me. And uh, so when I met, uh, it was a party here in Silicon Valley and down in Campbell, I think. And one of the designers of Apple was there and said, uh, we are looking for a good designer. Steve Jobs is crazy about design and uh, he wants some influence. And he liked German design. And when I worked for Sony, that was kind of a good credential. And then I met Steve. Uh, it's kind of his one, who has all those t-shirt competition? <laughs> uh, he won. Yeah. So that means something with me. <laughs> and. Uh, the problem was not so much that uh, we talked about design, brown design, Porsches, and so on, the typical German thing. But uh, I also asked, uh, uh, what do you want to do with the Macintosh? Which was back then a pretty secret project, in the early 82. Uh, I said, I want a million people to use the Macintosh. And so I said, a million, million Macs is different than uh, 10,000 Apple IIs. I mean, that's a totally different logistical thing. And uh, so there was a competition. We were not a European agency. We won it. Uh, but I think we won it because I mean, we had all this 10-year experience with Sony about Japanese production, collaboration, uh, design is never alone. Uh, it's part of a bigger strategy. It's embedded in innovation. It's embedded, in, embedded into the brand uh, feeling of, of the company. And uh, so Steve was convinced of that. He didn't like our designs in the beginning. You know. <laughs> so we were really spoiled to him. We wanted more Sony 2.0 to be honest, but uh, the great thing about him is he's probably the, the best learner on earth, as you know. And so uh, so we got Apple to to move it from a Silicon Valley startup into a global digital consumer brand. What, what, what did you design for Apple at that point? Well, the big point was that Apple at that point didn't have much uh, mechanical knowledge. 
to the head software and uh, give it a port. I mean, it was really thought up. Each room was a lab, but probably did other much. Mm -hmm. It was a division, so the chief had the Mac OS, the test stand was in it, and then started on AIM. Uh, I wish they could, because otherwise I would not never have made it. And uh, I think what I understood was working with Sony for so long that we needed, uh, we needed to integrate it into a bigger picture. And uh, so the visual expressions of what we did for Apple was much more minded to the design language or design style or brand feeling, which would be globally acceptable, but recognizable as Californian. So if coming from outside California is kind of a miracle land, <laughs> and mm -hmm. I think of it as a, as a Hollywood, whatever, say the Queen when you grew up and still. So what is the feeling of California? The beaches, it's kind of sexy, it's young, it's dynamic. And uh, it was both emotional character or the emotional symbolism which we brought to Apple and then it could be converted into uh, many other things. Another big aspect was we had to be simple, ecological, no paint. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, I mean, the best thing was the Sony, we always had to fire it bottom up with, with improvements and Apple, we could do it top down right away. I mean, we with an older set also cared for top down, but we had to expect the special type of pressure that Steve has to pull it in. And <laughs> <laughs> you know. So that's a feature, not a bug. Yeah, I think it's the best, totally underestimated how important leadership is for a great company success. I mean, if you look at Dell as a comparison now, mm -hmm. I mean, it still can change, but I think it looks pretty good. Or the iPhone versus the rest of the industry, like an 8% market share and 30 plus percent stock like mm -hmm. the Sony industry. I mean, it shows you somebody really cares. And the biggest problem for us designers is uh, that we don't respect business enough to understand what is important for them and for business people. The big problem is they do not understand what they can get from designers. It's integrative thinking, going beyond the typical aesthetic problems, looking at the entire strategy, what happens in two, four, five, six, ten years. And uh, I think it goes to the source of why I wrote the book in the end. Uh, you can always tell people and they, they will evangelize similar guys, but I think I'm old enough now to bring it to more people and hope more people pick it up. So th this brings me to a question that just befuddles me, which is if you look at companies like Dell, who have, for all intents and purposes, infinite money, um, why is it that a company like Dell with so much money, and there are many other companies, some in this valley, clearly they have the money to hire frog design or you know other designers or the next Jonathan Ives or whatever. Why do they continue to put out products that look like crap? I mean, I just don't understand it. It's not a matter of they can't afford the designers. Why do they put out such shit? I don't understand that. Yeah, the point is, uh, from a personal perspective, as a creative person, you have to work with people who want to go the uphill. Mm -hmm the mountain and uh, Dell has a different model. If you say Dell, I mean, they used the website way back, so that helped a bit, but uh, I think Michael Dell does not care about products. And that starts there. And then once I did a presentation, a couple of Apple people went there. Do you remember some right. of the comments? Right. And, so and John said, we have to bring design to, we did a couple of studies, we did, we worked with the people on the field. We got in the room and showed it, and everybody was on email and was on this and that and this and that, and that is why they produce crap. You mean they weren't listening to you when? No, they were, they were on the email, they're arrogant, they thought our model is unbeatable. That was way back before they went to mm -hmm. the big. And I think it's, uh, I mean, I think Apple, it was, and Sony, um, once, remember one guy once did this Steve Hicks has a presentation at Apple, and Steve said he just made a job interview for IBM. So he got people on track or out. And in Dell, there is not this passion for that people at the end will be happy about what they get, you know? They love what they get. But, but it seems so obvious to me, like if I were in the computer business or if I were building any kind of gadget, I would look at Macintosh and I would look at iPhone and iPod and I'd say, man, I want to do that. I want to build a, you know, something that generates as much lust. So you're telling me these CEOs are sitting around saying, I just want to build mediocrity and what? I, mean, wh I don't understand. What goes through their brain? Why would they not want to c copy? I, mean, I don't want to get into a lawsuit here, but. <laughs> <laughs> as long as they sue you, not me. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, 
the, the to be candid, the problem is, uh, I mean, I must say in my life, I had the privilege of working with many people who were similar like Steve mm -hmm. at the company on track. And uh, uh, but to give you one, uh, maybe a positive example, let me explain it. Uh, we worked at this uh, German global company, which is Tempo Instruments. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and an American doctor, Thornton, he invented the air turbine, which was the quicker to put it on tune, maybe you have to less pain and so on and so on. And a German engineer, uh, together with Thornton, then implemented into the product. So they built my leadership. And typically German, they produced everything out of steel and chrome, hygienic, and uh, doctors got calluses on their hands and some typical stuff. And my aunt w uh, was also a dentist. So she had her dental unit, I call it a pig, but it's definitely a business. <laughs> but still instruments were kind of hostile. And then we had the task to create a new uh, series of instruments. And the uh, co-CEO of the company was really adamant about innovation. So whenever somebody uh, protested, he first shut him down. He said, okay, nice set, but the answer is no. Mm -hmm. And so finally we went to university, the research and then we looked at the university, uh, we saw there were more female students in dental than male. Mm -hmm. And we think the whole ergonomics are wrong, and they confirmed it. So when you have in Germany alone 60%, 70% female students in dental, uh, medicine, uh, you need female products, more female products. So, so the company was all male. And so we came back and said the next product has to be female. That was big laughs and bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and then Mr. Zinzo said, shut up. I bought it. And this is good. And then somebody said, plastic is bad. And then we used the plastic we used for hard valves, which is 1,500 bucks a kilo, 700 a pound. So that convinced them it's expensive enough. And then funny enough, when the product came out, it was not only the ladies who got it, it was most all men bought it because it was nicer on the hand. So sometimes you take a detour, but you need a champion in the company who keeps it on track. Then in the big American companies, naturally, we have an addiction to mediocrity in this country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why is that? <laughs> it's the highest democracy misunderstood. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Uh, everybody has a say. Let's say we, we, work for, we work for a lot of big companies and there's much more effort, a big effort always to navigate between the divisions because they compete. With, I mean, you, you mentioned Alexandra. I mean, Motorola is a prime example of individual silos and not collaborating. Sony fell apart into like multiple computers, consumer electronics, video games, and so on, and never got it integrated. But Apple did just have great success. But the big point is most companies in America, they get division-wise, so everybody has his or her fiefdom, and then they compete internally because they know the other guy's numbers instead of competing outside. And then there's this, this also this addiction to political correctness. I mean, we cannot even say somebody is Edelman in the early Macintosh days. Some consultant brought in a metal piece. And I was naturally German-educated engineering, so we wanted clean and effective and beautiful in an open country. It has to be beautiful inside, like a Swiss watch. And this thing was a piece of crap, but a typical back then, oh, it's going to be great, it's wonderful, thank you, so-so and so-so. And then Steve said, what do you think? I said, back in my head, I had more heavier accent back then, it's shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what? And is this with the guy there? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I always said in front of the guy. Yeah. <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> it's otherwise, it's not fair. And then we found out, yeah, it was shit. So go back and to the real world. Make it elegant, make it less material, less make it I mean it works for the Mac as all of us. The elegance of the software inside outside has to be the same in mechanical representation. And I think no matter what you do, you have to do it right the first time. And that's normally not done here. Uh, you have to convince people, yes, there is an added obligation to be excellent, not just good. You have to be fanatical about it and it's really in the end just a designing issue. Um, but I love what you said, but for some people the reality is they don't work for a Steve Jobs or they don't work for a company that appreciates what you've just said. What do they do? Well, you, can you can fire your boss or start your own company. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's one thing, yeah. I mean, speaking of startups, uh, that's a very good point, actually, thank you. Uh, Silicon Valley also, especially if, if you look here, I like Silicon Valley. Naturally, I came here through Apple, first place. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, when you look at startups, many startups start on the wrong foot with a technical idea, and they forget that it's for people. So design is not only the aspect of aesthetics, it, but it's how to use it, how to interact with it. This is a bigger picture. So uh, my wife Patricia is uh, is actually a big part of my success because she balances me a lot and has some most of the time the better idea, mm -hmm. uh, more radical. But there is a saying that behind every successful man is an amazed woman. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> I, would say, I would say my wife requires a successful man. <laughs> <laughs> um, Husband. <laughs> yeah, but, but coming back to it, I think uh, maybe this book also, this is also why I wrote the book. If you start a company, look at what you can do in and orient yourself towards people rather than just have a solution and get funding. And uh, ultimately, you have to succeed in the market with real people who love you in the long term. Well, the, you know, one of the hats I wear is as a venture capitalist. And I'll tell you that if a startup designed this product <coughs> in order to please a venture capitalist to get funding, I can pretty much guarantee you <laughs> it'll fail. Because um, if, if you think big time CEOs have no sense of taste and aesthetic, God, venture capitalists are. Yeah, the aesthetic aspect design is not that simple. Yeah. Uh, design doesn't mean aesthetics. Aesthetics is only one of the tools mm -hmm. for a higher purpose. It's conceptualization. For example, you have, uh, you see Patricia working with a lot of startups, and they have go good ideas, and they're good people, but how you do it is you have to redo everything. And that's a waste. So why would you fund something you have to redo any time again and again and again. There's also too much copying, which actually is first of all an easy way to do something, but ultimately it's a dead end because there's a lot of what you like. And uh, I think it's both ways. Having not enough money is the better than having too much money. Mm -hmm. Coming to the first one, because what could Microsoft do with 40 billion if you just put they a stupid? They make yeah, they make Microsoft Bob and they make Zoom. And yeah, Zoom they buy a Toshiba for killer price, mm -hmm. way too expensive. I mean, the, the point is you have also to understand what is the passion of a company. And if you have a boss who doesn't respect what you uh, think, uh, and you think she or he is, is a bozo who's on Steve's terms, mm -hmm. then quit. <laughs> okay, you heard it here. <laughs> Churchill Club, <laughs> quit your job. Um, Do it yourself, yeah, get up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, other than Apple products, or let's take out the conflict of interest. Any, uh, take out any product you design. What would you hold up as products that you think capture this? Not just the aesthetics, but the functionality, the the interface between the the user and the product. What are some good examples that people can aspire to? I mean, um, the early example was the hand shower. I did it very. Thirty, forty years ago, hand shower. Hand shower? Yeah, there was a water pick. You know, you could turn into uh -huh. different tubes. And a German guy came up and said, "I want to copy this. It's a bad idea. It is way too expensive anyway. And to be open, it was too many parts. So he thought of this complicated. Does anybody still know the water pick showers? They're still around. And then the whole interaction is really clumsy, especially when it's wet. So we had the idea just to have a turning head. And then the whole production was mm -hmm. for Unix with Chrome and everything and long plastic. So we looked for some clean plastic that can sell everybody in production and lower the cost from $15 to 5 And uh, that was 1972. Then we got the show in Paris, uh, and people looked at it. This looks weird, to be sexual, whatever. <laughs> um, but people bought it like crazy, and still today it's sold. So. In addition, we also worked on the water consumption, so it would not be 40, 40 uh, 10 gallons a minute, but only uh, about four or three if it adjusted. So we still got the effect of feeling wet and clean. And uh, it's a success by its looks. It's very strange, but people are fascinated by its simplicity. It explains its user interface by its form. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely functional and uh, perfect. And uh, that's one thing. I think uh, another idea, which I think was really convincing, was the Walkman, which actually had a different genesis and mostly publicized. I mean, Ono Sound from Group One, which was innovative solution, clearly, 
was driving the subway morning and evening for hours. And we put some cassette recorders in his pocket, the batteries and the headphones to listen to his favorite music, which was, I think, Beethoven and the Vienna stuff. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they saw it that be a product, and uh, then Ibuka, some one of the co-founders, came by and said, yeah, we have to get the speaker out. That uses too much power. And then got the license to Sennheiser speakers from this German company, which are the foam, and just make them third of the size. So Fulke went, and uh, the idea was not so much that he wanted, he wanted to listen to music in the subway. And then to make it a good product, he had to be extremely portable, highly qualitative. Plus, it had to be affordable. I mean, he could not pay $5,000 like the equipment he already had in his pocket. And then the process of taking this funny idea, which one of the co-founders of Sony saw and liked, then turn that into a product uh, was a big step. They didn't risk the bank right away. They took an existing product and put the technology in the, what we call the portal, the blue silver one. And then they showed it to the marketing people. The marketing people uh, who wanted, it's like here you say there's a bombing warning, like in the Jacob Gunn movies, you know, everybody's under the table. Nobody showed up. So Marissa said, uh, I sell it myself. Went to Macy's and Dixon's and sold 200,000, I think, and they were gone in a couple of days. I is it true? There's a market because people could take music with them. Mm -hmm. It was lightweight. It was great. Uh, the action was easy, five buttons, yeah. stuff like that. Is, is it true about the story that Morita made shirts with extra large pockets so that it looked like it could fit in a I pocket? I tried that. Um, when everybody thought he had a shirt, I had a shirt with a warning, don't let them touch anything. I found out in Japanese <laughs> um, because I have kind of electric hands. Uh, so they tried to convince Morita to get a shirt with a bigger pocket that went from blue to brown, but he realized it's a scam. And they wanted, because everybody had to wear his pocket, no matter what he took, it has to go in here. And so with the disc man, uh, we had a big pocket, there, but the disc was for four inches, so the CD you could make smaller. <laughs> <laughs> but then they made a mini disc. <laughs> the mini disc uh, met his uh, pocket. Yeah, there are a lot of, of, you know, Japan is a playful country. Mm -hmm. They try all the tricks. Uh, <laughs> there's nothing untried. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'd love to know, as a designer, where you derive your inspiration. Um, yeah. I'd also like to know why we have static in this room. <laughs> oh, it's Mr. Fenwick. At least you don't have PowerPoint. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what I, where do you get your inspiration? Is it, I don't know. The inspiration is normally coming from a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you have to start, you have to be curious. And uh, uh, I mean, my first gift as a boy, my first toy was a Cadillac toy, the American company, which went one on the table. And then it didn't fall down, but it only did it one way, the other way it fell down. So I explored it and I wanted to know why didn't it work the other way? We only had a one-way one flip. So a little bit of Americanism in it, just choose one way or not no other. Anyway, so I took it apart and had it in a bowl. My mother was shocked and said, when Dad comes home, this will be a problem. Because this was an expensive toy. And uh, But I said, I keep it like this. I didn't get it together because it was sheet metal. and But I loved this toy inside. And then a generous gift from my parents, I got another one. The first one was teal, the second one was pink. Uh, but they were wholly promised not to open the pink one. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had a, a Cadillac 62 complete of a Cadillac 62 in part. And that was for me a dream because I understood uh, it was inside. So you have to get into the inside of anything. So for example, if you take Steve to the first meeting, the point was not so much to design a nice computer because computers before were kind of crooked typewriters with a bad TV monitor on top. Yeah? Uh, yeah, that's how it looked like. It was totally not cultural. And it's uh, like today's Dell, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> and we are, we are not alone. <laughs> not alone. Laptops also are boring, by the way. I don't have to go in. But uh, the point was, the interesting part, what the computer itself, what are the new semantics, then we got the idea of looking at alien. Because computers were the first product in history which were intelligent, some kind of intelligent. So I felt they had to go back to a human model, symmetrical, and more look like humans. So you have kind of an interaction 
with it, and it has to be not like this, but it has to be symmetrical, like a person with a friend. And that was the problem. How do you create a little friend in a company that's only concerned about technology and shortcuts and whatever, fix or fix or solutions? And I think that is, if you have that problem and recognize that, inspiration is easy because you have like a light tower, lighthouse, uh, ready to go. Um, I mentioned in your blog this example that some of my students, they give really wonderful tips because they understand it's a pretty tough process. And then tell a guy, okay, not it won't work. You don't have enough talent. Then the dad comes by. What do you mean there's not enough talent? He said, I mean, he did not see the spaceship in the teapot when they built it, you know? There's yeah. a spaceship in the teapot. Don't tell him that there's something else in it. If you rebuild the teapot, you're not creative. But the point is also, uh, when you have talent, you also need your diligence. So talent without diligence is a, is a crime. Literally, your diligence without talent is a, is a tragedy. So it goes both ways. And I think inspiration comes from recognizing and loving problems, big challenges. And that really guides you to do everything which helps you, which supports what you do, which doesn't support it, you forget. And that also, I think, gives you an idea, at least from my point of view, for a professional designer who is interested in this human integration, not to say, okay, because I like this so much, so you have to buy it now. You know, it's beautiful. You say, I don't like it. But then I say, are you thirsty? That's a different setting, you know? Mm -hmm. This is about thirst, not about a cup. So the, you have to find what is the underlying thing. And computers are about uh, artificial intelligence and expanding our, uh, our brains. Um, I would love to know, as uh, this world famous designer, uh, what kind of car you have, what kind of watch you have, what kind of pen you have. I mean, I just give me some data points about your aesthetics. Well, I mean, I love Porsches. Okay. Um, Which okay. model Porsche? No, it's a 911. Volkswagen. I got an early injection of Porsche when my dad took me to a race and I was flying by and I said, I have to bring this up. But if you go to Germany, Porsche is kind of a lightweight. It's not like a Mercedes, but it's a nice Mercedes back then. Then um, uh, my first wife didn't allow me a Porsche. She had kind of a superstition. I would get killed in it. Oh, <laughs> I would get rid of that wife just on that, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when I bought the Porsche, she knew that was finally over. <laughs> I mean, she's a nice person, don't get me wrong. <laughs> we just kind of wait for each other in the long run. So, um, watches. Uh, oh, so wi wi which model of Porsche? Because there's, you know. 911. 911. Yeah. You, you think a Boxer and a Cayman or a Cayenne is not nice. a Porsche? They're also Porsche, but they're, they're smaller. Yeah. I mean, it has a bit, I'm a, I'm a conservative person. It sounds strange, but privately I'm very conservative. Then, uh, I mean, I had many cars, so Patricia w can tell you a long story. <laughs> when I buy a new one, I have to sell the old one. I'm in tears for two nights. And yeah. I loved my car as a driver for 20 years. So that's one part. About watches, uh, it was a bit of an addiction. My wife takes care of it. Sometimes I get one, sometimes not. But once a year, I hope, is still the rate. Swiss watches, mechanical ones. Uh, which brand? Uh, any which is nice and mechanical and beautiful. So the... W which one is that? That is the uh, special edition Steve McQueen from Tahara from Monaco. But I also have a couple other ones. But they must be beautiful in my, it's not just that I collect them because they're in uh, most, it's also lately luxury watches become pretty tasteless. So then you don't buy them. Uh, then I like cameras. Uh, actually from analog to digital was a big blow to my collection because now everything's digital, but things as a digital later, things like that. Nice little closet behind me when I work and open it. I'm really happy to see it. And most of the time they look clean. They're <laughs> nicely organized. I like uh, music naturally. Wait, so which digital camera do you use? Yeah, uh, I use a Leica's. Uh, a Leica? Canon, I like Canon. I mean, I've, you can come by. It's I think the list is too long for this place. No, I ha Hasselblad's, I mean, top of the world. Because unlike, I mean, uh, thanks God I can afford it somehow. And if you collect, you collect the best, not the second best. Okay. But if it gives you a standard, uh, what is so wonderful about this product? I mean, everybody put a huge effort into it. It really emanates. 
always bias you. So look at that gadget. That's this other part of the closet. <laughs> you must have a big closet. Yeah. <laughs> 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 then I collect uh, music. I play music. I uh, pick up a pianos from Vienna. Person loves Then I uh, was in a rock band as a kid. We really made the money, bought an amplifier, went bankrupt again. Finally, I got a Gibson Les Paul split edition in a white. I got uh, strats. I got lots of guitars. Those are all the synthesizers I wanted in my life. So I'm a bit paralyzed in that room. Um, yeah, that's about it. Uh, yeah. yeah. The question was which phone and which computer? I use uh, the iPhone, the Blackberry, and a normal phone because each of them has a big advantage. You carry three phones? Yeah. Right now you have three phones? Well, the iPhone is in a car, but uh, the Blackberry is only good on email. The rest is crap. <laughs> the the normal phone is good as a phone. Yeah. Um, and the iPhone is good on the internet and media, but not a such a good phone. It is somehow, but uh, email doesn't work. And then I decided each of the best, and also have a Kindle, which is good to read. So I'm a single-purpose guy. Uh, each application works well on something. Then I get the gadget. Thanks, God. But I think that's you a problem. You have three phones? I, I, that's amazing to me. Okay. Huh. Um, and what computer? Uh, Macs and PC. Because I decide both. Well, well which Mac? It's an excuse. Huh? Which Mac? Oh, uh, this... I think uh, this big power thing on the floor. Okay. Has the dual core. Uh, and then the kids, my wife, we have uh, have those. And I designed uh, this Dreamcom thing, which is an ergonomic laptop. I got that also. Uh, I think they're probably maybe next to your house and a couple <laughs> others. The highest separation computers and devices in I the valley. I hope so. <laughs> How, uh, does Steve give you a discount or anything? Or in the beginning, he did, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> not anymore. Then, then he came back in 69. And it helped him for half a year, some advice. I wrote him a book, so I don't want to repeat it. I said, so you have to read the book. There must be some reason to read the book still. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, then I got something didn't work on my uh, Mac MacBook back then. And then one day, he sent a truck with about 20 computers in it, but finally the final one which worked. It was really mad at the guys in quality. And then I had one which worked forever. So uh, yeah, he cared for it. Yeah. Uh, Let's say you're a young person and you want to get into design. What's your advice? How do you do it? I mean, I, I do that uh, actually as uh, I'm, I'm doing teaching quite some quite a while, so you have some experience. You should actually start at the age of twelve. Yeah. To change a little bit your curriculum in school because school is about learning, but it's not about culture. And uh, you also the misunderstanding is that in school people think. Uh, okay, I'm a rational person, I go the rational way. Or I'm an artsy person, I'm against everything. I may be an opera singer, I may be an artist, anyway, I don't have to care. But that's wrong. You have to care for everything. You have to be really educated and you have to learn how to learn. And But the direction of creative people actually is very chaotic somehow. And also a little bit asking more, why would you do that and how could you change it? So I think not accepting reality is not very popular in school, as you know. So in Vienna, I do a program with high school students. Uh, we go to schools. Who are the difficult students here? The rebels, things like that. And then we do set up the classes for them to get kind of a prep for what design could be. And uh, we got a couple of kids out of that program already. Then ultimately, you have to be aware that it's a profession uh, which is very polarizing. I mean, you're the good or you're not nobody. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the the impact of design, for example, BMW, a friend of mine, uh, told us, and it's everywhere else the same thing, a high-tech company, maybe a computer company, maybe a car company, if they invest about 0.8 to 1% in the product life cycle of a product into design, that's already a lot. <laughs> but the effect of design is 70 to 80% of the buying and using decision. So you have to be aware that you have only a minimal budget compared to all the other guys who waste the money on engineering <laughs> and management <laughs> meetings. Comes back to the other question, why is so much crap? Yeah. It's a little bit, a little needle which is projected to the moon and moon, a little thing moves miles back and forth. So you have to be aware that you have a huge responsibility and people must like that responsibility and cherish it. And so if I look at my class, uh, I have each year six or eight students 
Um, so we have about 150 people applying for six spots. Actually, they won't get in because uh, Australia has some success, so it's a good thing, which I appreciate. And people, even when they get rejected, are given a briefing what they should do to pass, and they, they come back and pass, which means they send me emails and they learn in the meantime what they were missing and also understand, yes, I want to do that. That's the most important. I want to do that. There's no other way. When I discovered a design, I knew I'm condemned to it. I either succeed or not. And I think this total dedication with no exit is also very important because you have a lot of obstacles. You swim against the stream, smell a lot of water. The only benefit is you don't swim with a dead fish. <laughs> but, uh, well, what if you're not 12 years old, though? What if, <laughs> what if you're like 25 or 30? Is there? It's never too late. I have a guy from Iran. He immigrated from Iran to Europe, ran a restaurant, heard about our program, and said, I want to study design. Had the talent, the dedication, and uh, is now ne nearly close to his diploma. And he's 34. And when I was at Parsons School of Design, uh, one of the uh, uh, graduates was a doctor from Korea. She retired at 62, studied design, and graduated in design and s at age 69. But with the human knowledge she had before, and now I understand what people need, to need for their minds. Right. Right. So there's no limit. OK. Yeah. Um, let's take questions from the audience. Do you have a, are you running a mic, or? Yeah? My name is Carola Thompson from SAP. And we talked a lot about design. Just curious to know what you see the role of user research being. So anthropology, sociology, things like that. Well, SAP is a good example. Thank you. Uh, we were asked, uh, I mean, originally, as you know, I came from physical products. And with the Mac and also with Sony, some of the projects had involved, were involved with software. So software architecture. The basic problem of user interface is that software can be launched as a prototype. And the users will fix it over time. Or t tell about the uh, mistake. And uh, when Hasso, we met Hasso about 10 years ago, actually 11 years ago, and then uh, SAP was really, I don't want to say that, not very known for user-friendliness. User it also had to do with enterprise and all this stuff. And I mean, most of the software interface we see is a crime on human culture, <laughs> still, still today. So uh, the big point was, I asked Hasso, what's the problem? I said, I cannot use it myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm one of the founders. And I only get letters because when people complain, especially Americans and Germans, they call, call the boss. So uh, then we analyzed how people work it. And they had, uh, let's say, expense reports was eight screens with this ABAP system, whatever that was called back then. And you had to go from here, we found a mistake, we were all the way back. It was like uh, back to like the wasp. You know, the wasp can create a hole with a leaf and cut the leaf and do all the things, but if you take the leaf away, it doesn't use a hole it, it picked out. It goes back to the tree, cuts a new leaf, cuts a new hole, and so on and so on. So that's software. <laughs> and <laughs> and Hasso also couldn't log in. <laughs> he couldn't <laughs> and then this just work. Hasso is our first customer. What can he do? And so he's highly intelligent, highly creative, but not very uh, structured. And then we did this expense report on the one screen, which was quite simple. I have been there. I did this. I could use a taxi. I did a whatever. But behind the scene, actually, they had to integrate eight screens into one. And the developers complained like hell. And then Hasso had the greatness to say, makes sense to have expense reports on one page, on one screen. I mean. So by pushing it through the system at SAP, its usability went up uh, by 70%, which means the mistakes got reduced by 82%. And the time gainings were huge. That was a small example. So we went through all the 40,000 screens and the different actions, like ordering things. I mean, uh, back then, there was a famous example that somebody at Nike ordered 5 million pairs of shoes instead of 5,000 pairs. Uh, I mean, it didn't see the mistake because it was so hidden in that uh, software. It was not SAP in that case. And so let's just make it acceptable to humans. And I, I think uh, user interface should be that if you bring it home to your mom, to your wife, to your kids, kids actually can use it. My kids are smarter than me. <laughs> Maybe my mom would be an example. If she can use it, it's fine. If she cannot, you made a mistake. 
And another example we had with Disney, when we did this uh, course for Disney, um, we had a huge button for the software and whatever happened, and the kids uh, were playing around, age three to five, which actually is before they become tech nerds. And uh, but we just did what the kids understood, uh, and then grown-ups bought it, similar like this Dental Instruments female, but the male bought it, males bought it. So uh, make it make it understandable, also make it smart. Smart design means huge programming effort. So that's why it doesn't happen so often, because when it works in the digital domain, fine, ship it. When people go through, oh, where do I find it? They hide the most important functions in a small sublink. Um, and uh, I mean, it's like this famous example, if software would be airplanes, you would have a jet fighter with a couple of switches and one would be the ejection seat and next to it the same shape and size would be cabin light. <laughs> 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 so we work on that. It's a, <laughs> it's a challenge in process. George Grenley, uh, Planet Reality. Steve Jobs was quoted as saying, design isn't about how something looks, it's about how it works. And I wonder how that applies with the poor designer Dell, for example, and at the end of the day, they're gonna beat Windows on the box. How do you get around that kind of design situation? You mean Adele? Adele, the Dell computer, for example. I right? tried, I couldn't. I mean, a, a MacBook Pro running Windows is, let's face it, it's Adele. Yeah. Really, I think it's also the cultural feel of a product. Uh, it's not only the function. And I think it has a little bit to do with, with human, uh, our human culture. You know, everybody likes his kids, or her kids, because they're very similar to us. So this human quality of there's more to it than beauty, there's familiarity. And ideally, I think uh, fascinating products are built on a tradition of human tradition of culture. So whatever is, the base of it is co familiar to us, but one innovation stands out. So it's not that suddenly we are completely disconnected from our past. That's why many gadgets are so disconnected. They say nothing. And uh, I think uh, what, what uh, Apple succeeded in is a tradition of nearly for, uh, 30 years. Uh, also the organization learns how to deal with it. And if you go to Macworld, all the graphics are nice and clean and uh, it's just simple rules. And simplicity is the most important and most difficult things to achieve. So the simplicity allows you not to think so much about it. It communicates nice, and so it's many more aspects of that, which I think ultimately everything a company does is an expression of its culture. And to build this innovation and human-minded culture, I think, is uh, the real secret. I hope that answers it. You've got the mic. Devices are just testing. Put them on. Yeah, that's. Uh, I would love to do that on the cover for a couple of years ago. Newsweek called us. I had the same problem, and the editor in chief said, "Can you not design something which could integrate everything?" We call it pet rock, like this little well the pet rock. You know, little stupid thing. So we made the pet rock, which would be a phone, would be a computer, would be everything, and we got great response. But uh, none of our clients liked it because. Normally they are too insular. That's really a so shall we shall think the iPhone is very integrative compared to all the other things, but uh, the email that, that is actually by uh, whim, I don't know. <laughs> so but but the point to, to your question is I don't like when you have to dig through a device multiple times to find what you look for. It's just not fun. I mean keep it simple. And so the three devices I agree is a compromise, but it's a better one than have this one thing that is pushing the buttons. Well, wh what do you see as the shortcoming of the iPhone? Well, for me, it's the email because I need to be connected with my students, with talk, with many so friends. So it's the lack of a keyboard? No, it's the, the email doesn't push yet. It pushed? Yeah, I know, but uh, yeah, it's the keyboard is also a bit of a problem, yeah. mm -hmm. to be honest. Yes.
Do we play? Yeah, I mean, designers have to be kind of uh, staying in the place of childhood. Um, I mean, like in the Bible, when Jesus said, stay, be like the kids, there's something to it because when we get older, we also see that with high school students, at a certain point, they don't ask anymore because the teacher said to ask me this stupid question. And uh, for example, one question one of my son, my son Max had, uh, if the universe is finite, the universe is expanding. What is the space? The universe is not there yet. And that's a pretty difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, we keep working on it. It's not a stupid question. It's an incredible question. So I think we get discouraged over time to behave and become more corporate or adapted. System, um, there's this bad word, blending in, which I think is the most, it's also an American vice, blending in. Which has a lot to do with immigration culture, I understand that, but at one point you have to keep your your youthfulness, your naivete maybe even. And I'm an extremely impractical person in private life. So when something breaks in the house, one of my sons is a practical genius, so that fix everything. When something goes broke, uh, uh, where's daddy? Then he's at the hardware store getting some tools, <laughs> and then you let's fix this before he comes back. <laughs> That's not the huge damage, con really damage control here. <laughs> but in my job, being so naive and assuming things can work is a huge asset. And thanks God, I found team members all my life uh, who then made it real, including my wife, by the way. So, yeah, you have to have a crazy idea which is completely surreal, but it's it's playful, and you don't, you are not ashamed of saying it and asking for it, and then suddenly you find people who can do it. I mean, that's one of the secrets. Uh, never hesitate to ask for the impossible. Yeah? Um, you, mentioned you mentioned before about um, how you actually got into it and why you're flying. So I just wanted to say, this is my first or second trip to the Dutch Republic. I did it with um, a school with because of the bond tax back then, the salary of teachers and education. Um, and I was just wondering, how do you cope like it, it is culturally that important to, to save for design decisions and even in your business. How yeah. do you get the stage for that over the years? I mean, the context between culture and design, I think. I mean, culture is probably, the recorded culture is 8,000 years. The recorded the design side, I think, is 100, 100 years, maybe. <laughs> maybe 80 years. So design is a young profession which has a lot to do with mass production, which was phenomena before, but I think to use, a use a, a create a profession which came from architecture engineering and is emerged as a design uh, profession as you say it, that clearly was uh, afterthought to overall culture. But the big point, if you take Apple, uh, when we started to design these things, that we were dot matrix printers. I think some of you were not even born back then. <laughs> but it was an ugly picture, an ugly noise, and really bad. And so, what we discussed then was there is type style. I mean, there's type type fonts designed by great artists, and they are part of human culture. And so we went to Berlin to Bertold, the company, and licensed the type styles. And then, with the help of Canon and using the Mac as a driver for the Canon uh, photo printer, we could create <laughs> nice images with anti-aliasing. And we got the achieved culture of printing already here. The computer dropped it to the second floor, second basement, we brought it back up and then we created a new industry actually with this desktop publishing. And everybody could be a graphic designer more or less, which I think is also a big point. Uh, in the beginning, Gut uh, Gutenberg invented the printing process to print the Bible. That was a singular focus. But then as people more people started to read, it was in China, similar things, China printed long before, by the way. Really not so well known. <laughs> But then people always started to read, became literate. So ultimately, we we got all the talents, became more poets. So we got all the arts moving up. And I think it's designed to be similar. If you have the tools, like uh, desktop publishing, like alias 3D software, the more talent, talented people will find to it. And I think ultimately, each of us will be able to be a designer on a certain level. Then the few designers who are really talented will jump up again and become the, the top, top people again. I think what we have by the tools, improving the tools, also will improve the culture and then lift up 
uh, all of us collectively to the next level. And I think that's really important to understand the side of all the e economics. Uh, in the end, uh, I think nobody dies regretting he didn't work or become rich enough. I think you look at your achievements much more in emotional terms. And I think so cultural, I think, in the end, is a decisive factor in the also in the economic competition. Okay, next question. Niels? Yeah, hi. Yeah. Um, you mentioned music earlier. Uh, earlier in my career, I worked at different magazines on the editorial side, and uh, uh, what I found was that very few people in other departments had much to say about editorial content. But when it came to the cover and other design elements, every department seemed to have an opinion. And uh, I wonder in your client engagements, do you value those kind of inputs or would you rather be left alone? How does that, how does that work? I, th I mean, a good advice is to listen. And uh, the younger the person, the better you listen. Because the younger the person, the less compromise the feeling is. At one point, I don't know if Frog still do does it, but uh, at one point I asked the youngest frog in the team to speak first. Because if the seniors speak, the young kid will not be mm -hmm. uh, open enough. Uh, I think it's always good when at home I show something to my wife, she says she doesn't like it, I drop it. How should I convince her? I know her since 25 years or 26 years. She will not budge. And if my <laughs> kids, <laughs> and, she, and if she doesn't like it, so what's the case? I mean, as long as you somebody doesn't like it, you can make it better. I think that's that the worst thing in design, especially when people try to convince each other how good I am and you must understand, I bullshit. Listen and uh, go for the better, is especially children. Is your wife here? Is yeah. Right? Where is she? Where is this mythical wife we keep referring to? Where is she? Stand up. <laughs> yeah, we want to hear that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm stubborn too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but also, we just created an extra startup that Trisha's involved with. And then our daughter, the car said, she spoke it really. I mean, I still have this accent, my wife too, but our kids are so American now. And then she said it's so American slang. And it was so, so she sounds like Tampu. Oh gosh, that was dead in the moment. <laughs> and I think that's the point. If you get rejection, listen. And positive input is actually hard to get because, uh, but rejection is always good. Might makes you better. Actually, we do a concept with my students that at one point we say, you do a project, but now rej you reject the project. Now what do you know? And it's unbelievable what's coming up. So the, the polarity of yes and no is very close in the brain. But, uh, but you know, to push back on you a little, Steve Jobs doesn't care what anybody says, right? I mean, he's not listening to rejection or comments from other parts of Apple or anybody. Yes, I, I think I disagree a bit. Yeah? But I think he listens. To who, when? <laughs> 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 Name me one time. <laughs> he, uh, he listened to me on this metal piece, which was shit. <laughs> okay. <so laughs> no, he listens a lot. <laughs> no, he listens a lot, yeah. I must say. But actually, at one point, you must be careful with Steve, I mean he's not here, but you can say that. When he accepted something and you try to change your opinion later, that's a hard one. Uh -huh. So eh. if, if you sell him on something, you better are sold. <laughs> 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 okay, here. Hi, uh, Tom Burton, Silicon Valley Bank. Um, so let's talk about the design process from a different direction. Have you ever had to bring the design process to completion, not because you're satisfied with the functionality or the aesthetics or the simplicity, but because you ran out of time or you ran out of money. And what's, what's that like for you? Well, it's very frustrating, but it happens quite often. I mean, th there's one point. I mean, to be totally honest, especially our the company Frog is a pretty big agency now worldwide, nearly 500 people. And you have to find a way to master compromise. You cannot always be dictatorial and uh, expect ideal. Uh, and some clients, when I was still active, they said, don't, hardwood was good for the pitch, but don't bring him back. <laughs> <laughs> Give us hardwood light. <laughs> 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 and that's fine. We have enough creative people. Um, it's a bit, uh, a lot of aspects are, it's a bit like medicine, you know, some things cannot be healed, but you try to improve them. Like diabetes, things like that, you have to manage them. And a lot of the big corporations need to be managed instead of healed. So uh, 
that's that's part of it. But ideally, personally, I always think you can win if things understand it. You can do a lot of things. A little examples of Jack Welch, a uh, big company GE back then, and they acquired the electric motor company in Indianapolis and some guys in Korea and with this conglomerate about electric motors from little small small ones for car li window lifters to big ones in trains. And then this place in Indianapolis was pretty dirty. It was sand, casting, steel, and whatever. And then Jack came in with his team just flying through, and the CEO was an English chap. And then uh, he just said, it's dusty here. Ugh. And disappeared. So then we did a pitch, and we proposed production methods, which were the best causing exchange uh, exclusion profiles for zillions of millions in investment. And then this came into the corporate uh, thing up, and they said, oh, it's a stupid idea, it looks great, but uh, stupid and expensive and investment. Are you sick in your mind? And Jack Welch looked at it, how would you justify that investment? We said, no dust. <laughs> <laughs> and they did it. Uh. Huh. The dust was gone. And it's right, in the end, it was a successful strategy. Okay. Um, I think we're about five seconds. <laughs> so how about some last uh, last thoughts and we'll I mean be optimistic and I think uh, look out for the problems and approach them because there's nothing more satisfying than being involved with the real big problems of the clean energy and a lot of stuff in our country right now okay. and don't look so much for the money look for the people and that you go happy to bed and wake up happy and I think that's the most important thing and really that you can be proud of yourself and proud of your kids, yourself, and you look at the mirror. And it's still a project in process with myself and not others happy, but I think it's a very nice goal to aspire to. All right, thank you. Um, I let me, uh, can I give you a plug? Can I give a plug for some? No, okay. Okay, thank you very much, Harp. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> just want to thank you both very much and buy his book all right it's a great book you yeah. need to buy his book in fact we do have for your convenience copies of the book out in the lobby if you care to pick your copy up today and hartman has generously uh, consented to stay around a little bit and sign it for you and to interact with you personally uh, and i'm sure that guy will do so as well both of you, as a small gesture of thanks, we have to keep you in T-shirts, don't we? Thank uh, you. <laughs> we've got a Churchill Club T-shirt for you. And I uh, want to thank again Fenwick and Alltop, and thank you all for coming. Please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs> Four four one three three. Okay. Yeah. And and text the word all time. You'll get a recurring message. The link right now is the pink all design shirt. Oh my gosh. Well, you didn't want me to plug anything. I couldn't plug it. Four four one three three. Text the word all time. A L L T M E. If you still have your mic on. Actually my, this is actually my card we'll flash over, guys. Don't worry, we'll sticker. Know know, right? Cool. A sticker, very nice. This is a dual purpose yeah. business card. Okay. Got it. <laughs> my my is on the back. <laughs> this is cool tech. Yeah, I like it. Lemon. Get it back? Yep. Yeah. So now click on that link. And then it'll be it'll be all the design news. All be designed. And that'll work forever. I got for, it. Yeah. You know. Well, you should bookmark it. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Or put it on your desktop. You know how you make a yeah, desktop yeah, yeah, like. Yeah, he's icon. already cool. an avid user. I have him. So. Oh, I love him. Yeah. I love him. <laughs> the only thing I'm trying to figure out, your support team is trying to help me. Is when you pick something, it goes to an all top. It does an all top trade. Trade. And they said it's. I forget the company. Contacted them, but they haven't gotten objective back to marketer. Yet, objective marketer. Well, what's wrong with the frame on your phone? No, no, no. I like it. Oh, I like it. I want flywheels to do this. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah.
Oh, well, that's the service they provide. It's yeah. Well, I've contacted the Spectrum Park here, and they said, we're busy now. We'll get back to you. This is for you or for the bank? For me. Oh, are you the bank guy? Were you no, the I'm not the bank oh, guy. Oh, that guy's no. I'm the design guy. So, you know... So what Objective does, if this, let's say this is a BBC article, okay? Yeah. So Objective puts the frame there. Right. And there's the all top load. Right. And then there's, so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there's links to other stuff. Right. So let's say the tweet says, uh, you know, two-headed
the one topic is you can I say. This is where we aggregate all the news about social entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so you should check mm -hmm. that out. Okay. Yeah, you'll find it very useful. Yeah. Um, another topic that I want to have a chat with you is a quick one is between the angels and the VCs. Yeah. There seems to be a, a gap, a chasm I, I, I of. Don't, I don't think so. No. I mean, uh, not really. No. So who who is the one that kind of gives the the founders and the startups, the TLC that they need, coaching, mentoring at this very personal level between Honestly, the angels the and answer, the yeah. no one. No one. I mean, angels try to do it, but it's you know. But right. also VCs. You think a VC is giving you tender loving care and you're deluding yourself? No, no, I understand. So there so is no one. So if there was one, if there was a, a group of people that you could confide with, that you can pick up the phone two o'clock in the morning and say, you know what, I'm running into this. Either marketing issue or yeah. product issue, I who would that be? Much more likely to be an angel investor and mentor than a VC. Right, right. Much more. Right. And if there is an angel fund that actually makes that their core objective, that would make sense. I mean, would the, the angel funds, they're making dozens of investments, 50,000 right. at a time. Well, you know, to be successful as an angel or a VC is the law of big numbers. Okay. The law of big numbers means you just don't know what it you means. You right? dilute your exactly. emotional emotional right, investments, right. right? So I don't I don't have an answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you, uh, I don't know what kind of availability do you have. Would I be able to invite you to lunch or, or coffee to have a uh, conversation? I, I'm traveling. Oh, did I give? I gave you a card. Yeah, yeah. So. Probably. Um, yeah? Would I be able I to? I am really jammed these Oh, days. I know you are. That's why I'm asking if yeah, that would be even a possibility. It would be hard. It would be hard. Yeah. How would Honestly. I uh, How would I make it happen? I don't <laughs> Help me get traffic for all topics. There you go. How's okay. That? All right. Fair enough. Thanks, guys.